Flipping hell, we have Retroid's latest handle to review, and I promise that's the last bad pun we will use. Maybe? First, a very brief unboxing. There's a card which shows the controls and tech specs, which is a bit pointless, but it's there nonetheless. Next, we have the Retroid Pocket Flip itself, which we will show in more detail shortly. Underneath is a USB Type-C charge cable. And that's it, I said it was a brief unboxing. The Retroid Pocket Flip measures around 5.4 by 3.2 by 0.9 inches when closed and weighs around 270 grams. It's very portable and easily fits into your pockets. It's available in 5 colours, black, 16-bit US, indigo, sport red and watermelon. The clamshell design opens up to reveal the 4.7 inch touchscreen with a 750 by 1334 resolution. It is the same found on the Pocket 3 and 3 Plus model. On the lower half there is a classic D-pad and to the right four gaming buttons. Below are Hall Effect sliders that are clickable and just below that are the start and select buttons. On the bottom there is the power button and headphone port. On the left side is a micro SD card slot and on the right are the volume buttons. The top half of the case has the left and right trigger and shoulder buttons with two additional M1 and M2 buttons which can be configured in the settings. There is a USB Type-C charge port and a micro HDMI port for output to your TV or monitor at 720p resolution. Overall, the Retro Pocket Flip is comfortable to play on. All of the front facing controls are within easy reach of each other but I did find that the shoulder buttons were slightly obstructed by the top half of the case and you find yourself rubbing the back of it whilst playing. The two macro buttons do require adjusting your fingers to comfortably press. I rarely use these though, so it was not a major issue for me. If you are familiar with the Pocket 3 Plus, then this all may sound familiar as the specs are mostly identical. There is the Unisoc Tiger T1618 octa-core processor, which has two A75 cores and six A55 cores. For graphics, it has the Mali G52 MC2 processor running at 850 MHz. There's four gigs of LPDDR4X RAM and 128 gigs of internal eMMC storage. You can add more storage via the micro SD card slot. It has Wi-Fi 5 support, which you can use to go online for the Google Play Store, web browsing or playing games online. There is also Bluetooth support for wireless peripherals such as an extra controller. Different to the previous models is that it now has a slightly larger battery at 5000mAh. In our battery life test running 3 d Mark benchmark on a loop, we got just over 5 hours which is very good. The Retroid Pocket Flip runs on Android 11 and when first booted up you are presented with a welcome guide that goes through the initial setting up. Here you can choose which emulators and software you wish to install. You can also choose to use the standard Android or Retroid Zone launcher which is set up mainly for emulation. You do need to set it up from scratch and it's relatively painless, but it does take a bit of time. You essentially go through each system, add a ROM folder and it will scan it and add the recognised games for easy access. By swiping from right to left on the right side of the screen, you can open the overlay software which gives you quick access to commonly used functions, system information, the built-in screen mapping software and more. It's a very useful feature, especially the mapping software, which lets you use the controller on Android games that do not support them. Google Play Store is fully supported and you can download and update any games and apps you wish to. This is a great example of how a Android Retro handheld should work. A nice setup process, useful launcher and overlay software, and no jumping through hoops to get to the Play Store installed. Top marks here. We've run a few benchmarks which we can use the results to see the Flip's performance as well as compare it to other Android based handhelds. Geekbench runs a series of CPU based tests on the device. We can see that the Pocket Flip scores 382 and 1396 on the single and multi core benchmarks. It's pretty much identical to the Pocket 3 and RG505 which we expected to see as they have the same processors. 3D Mark tests the CPU and GPU working together for their best performance. We get a score of 2215, which again is similar to the Pocket 3 Plus and RG505. Overall, there are no differences between the three handhelds in terms of benchmark performance, which is great to see.
Before we get onto the emulators, let's take a brief look at Call of Duty Mobile, which I have quickly mapped the controller to the on-screen buttons. The on-screen mapping lets you play games with controller, even if the game does not support it. It takes a few moments to map the buttons to the screen icons, and depending on the game, it may take a little extra tweaking, especially the joystick sensitivity, but otherwise it works very well and definitely gives you the upper hand in games. Next, we are briefly trying Xbox Cloud Gaming. Providing you have a decent Wi-Fi signal and internet speed, you will have no issues at all with streaming games on the Retroid Pocket Flip. We did not see any stuttering or reduction in quality, including busy scenes. It simply works great. We are next trying a bunch of emulators and games which were suggested by our followers on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. Thanks to everyone that suggested a game. We could not use all of them, otherwise the video would be very long. Keep an eye out for your name in the game info box. All of your 8 and 16 bit consoles and computers will have no issues on the Retroid Pocket Flip. So you can enjoy SNES, Mega Drive, PC Engine, Amstrad Spectrum and many more classic consoles often with upscale graphics for better visuals. We won't spend too much time on them as we have plenty of newer games to cover. We do not often get many arcade game requests so I wanted to check out a couple of suggested ones. With arcade games, I find you often have to spend a little time to make sure you are running the correct emulator with the ROM sets you have. Some ROMs may be from AIM 2003 and others from AIM 2010 as an example. With RetroArch, you can download a few different MAME and arcade cores and it should put them in the correct core when you import the games. The Sega Saturn does not get much love, but personally I find it to have some great games that are often overlooked. Ignore the flickering text on Sega Rally, it's just an issue with the emulator as it usually works great. Otherwise, all of the games I tried work just fine. There are a couple of Dreamcast emulators you can try on the Retroid Pocket Flip. I played a few games on each one and did not see any issues with performance as this processor can run them just fine. Again, there's a few PlayStation emulators in RetroArch and native apps such as DuckStation that you can use. PlayStation runs great on this handheld and I did not have any problems with performance. I recommend DuckStation as you get excellent results from it including graphical improvements. Now we get into the will the games work or not area. PlayStation 2 emulation is relatively early on Android. But with EFA SX2 we do see a few games working great. 13 and Shinobi were suggested and they do play very well. Other games such as Outrun Coast to Coast are sadly not playable at default settings. You can however squeeze a bit more performance out of it by reducing the rendering resolution for example. The Dolphin emulators have great compatibility, but the Retroid Pocket Flip and similar handhelds do struggle with performance. Our go-to game Burnout 2 works great and runs at mostly 60 frames per second. However, you will find many games that are running at slower speeds, with many being unplayable. Our PSP go-to game God of War runs at 60 FPS, with very rare frame drops but nothing that spoils the gameplay. We were suggested to try Killzone and could not get this running at a decent frame rate. I am not sure offhand if it's an emulator compatibility issue or a performance issue. The Citra emulator has seen some decent performance improvements over time and I have noticed less stuttering when shader caching on Sonic Generations. It will however still have some performance issues when shader caching for the first time, but subsequent playthroughs will be far smoother. Not all games will work great, but there are a fair few that will. The PlayStation Vita emulation with Vita 3K is relatively early in terms of development, but we were able to get some games running. The excellent TXK is very playable, as were a few other games. There were also a few games not quite there in terms of performance, such as Street Fighter vs Tekken. Another emulator fairly early in development is Skyline. I tried a bunch of games and many of them were not working, simply going back to the menu or false closing back to the launcher. However, I did get Sonic Mania running and it runs very well. 
don't get too excited though. This is a fairly basic game, so don't expect many games to run like this. The Retroid Pocket Flip is a very good handheld in general. Its main use is for emulation and this is about as good as you're going to get in this price range right now. It can emulate up to the PlayStation 1 and Dreamcast era with no issues at all. And as we go into the more recent generations we find fairly good support for the handheld consoles. The Vita 3K and Skyline emulators are early in development but some games are playable which is impressive. But don't expect performance to be much better on these going forward. The Retroid Pocket Flip does offer more than emulation. You can also play a wide variety of native Android games and use all of the apps from the Google Play Store. It's great for watching videos either locally or streaming from YouTube, web browsing and of course gaming with a controller. The choice of Android or Retroid Launcher is a nice touch. You can set up your game collection to have easy access from a decent game browser. It does take a bit of time to set up, but it's just as long as setting up RetroArch or each emulator individually if you wanted to. We also like the overlay software, which gives you quick access to common functions such as screen mapping input, streaming, recording and screenshots. It's done well and is very useful. The controls are something that I have some mixed feelings on. It is comfortable to play on, but I did find the shoulder buttons were a little obstructed by the top half of the case. It's not a major issue, just something you would need to get used to, where a traditional handheld will not have any obstruction. That was really my only complaint with the Retroid Pocket Flip. So the real decision comes down to if you want a traditional handheld such as the Pocket 3 Plus or a clamshell design with the Pocket Flip. Let us know in the comments which one you would pick and why. You can learn more about the Retroid Pocket Flip and 3 Plus and order yours today at droix.co.uk or droix.net for worldwide shipping. Don't forget to take a moment to subscribe so you won't miss out on future videos like this. Thanks for watching and we hope to see you back in the next one.